Okay, hey, push students, welcome to uh, Chapter 3, uh, Part 1 lecture, our discussion here. Uh, big picture, what we're looking at in Chapter 3 is England's push to surpass the Dutch as the leading power in the world. Um, and they knew to do this that they would have to protect a very, very valuable uh, sugar plantation system. Understand whether it was tobacco, cotton, any of the cash crops grown in the United States, none of them equaled the sugar, the value of sugar in uh, in Brazil and the uh, West Indies. So keep that in mind. Okay, let's go through some things that we're going to talk about. Uh, some things to focus on, uh, some of the essential questions. What factors led to the creation of distinct colonial regions in British North America? Uh, North America is now going to be dominated by Britain. And also, how did relations between colonists and Indians evolve over time? So these are some of the essential questions that we're going to try to answer uh, by the end of this chapter. Uh, let's start with uh, the aristocratic power in the Chesapeake region. Remember, the Chesapeake region will be you know, Virginia, uh, Maryland, but, uh, these areas here, Jamestown, thank you, Jamestown, Virginia. Okay. Uh, the Carolina elites, these planters, were basically wanting to establish a old-style European feudalistic system. They wanted to be nobles, they wanted peasants underneath them, uh, they wanted to reinstitute the manorial system where you had a manor, everything was made on the manor, and everybody who worked at the manor uh, was dependent upon the Lord for protection, for goods, for services. Um, in this they were a big failure. Uh, the manorial system never took up because uh, a lot of your early settlers, especially like in North Carolina, uh, they were poor settlers, they were runaways from other colonies such as Virginia, some of them were Quakers, and remember that Quakers are very, uh, they believe in equality and pacifism, so they didn't really go quite as planned as far as aristocratic power. And remember, hopefully from world history, uh, what an aristocrat is, an aristocracy. It is people who have power and wealth uh, through the ownership of land. That's what makes them wealthy. Tobacco, they grow tobacco, they grow cotton, they grow sugar, whatever it may be. Okay, next, uh, let's talk about the Quakers themselves. Uh, the Quaker colony was founded by William Penn. That's where Pennsylvania is named after him, of course. Uh, Penn was a wealthy man in England. Uh, he, was, his, he was owed money. He had a debt from the king, and the king decided to pay him back that debt by granting him a colony in the New World, in North America. And by the time Penn got around to going over there, he had kind of made this conversion uh, to leading a Quaker lifestyle, which is very simplistic. Uh, he gave up his lavish, rich life uh, that he had lived before. And he comes over, and William Penn is very different from other English and how they um, dealt with Indians. He was a pacifist. They believed in pacifism. They got along with the native Indians very well. They lived in harmony with each other. Also, the Quakers were uh, religiously tolerant. Uh, they were very different from the Puritans, who were not tolerant at all. And that's what you need to understand in this time period, is that uh, there's such a fight over religion. Today, we guys live in a society where, oh, well, I'm Presbyterian, I'm Baptist, I'm Methodist. You know, nobody, uh, they don't care as much today. Are you worshiping God? Okay, good. Uh, back then, though, there were some very big splits in doctrine. And the Puritans were strict. If you were in Massachusetts, you were going to, it's their way on the highway. The Quakers didn't believe that. They also didn't believe in that Calvinistic belief of predetermination pre, pre or predestination that at the beginning of the time, God had already decided how many people were going to be saved. Um, there was also equity of the sexes. Uh, women could stand up in church and talk. Uh, they believed in something called the inner light, uh, that people could talk directly to God, which was a very new idea in Christianity. Uh, up to that point, whether it was in Catholicism or the early Protestant religions, uh, you talked to your minister, your minister talked to God on your behalf. So the Quakers were very different. Um, they resisted authority. They didn't like to bow down before rank because they felt like they should only bow down before God. And as such, they were very much persecuted against in England, and that's why they fled with William Penn uh, to the New World. And so they were able to establish this colony and, and do things their way. Uh, so there's a little bit of the background on the Quakers. We're definitely not done with them. We'll revisit them some more uh, later on. Uh, glorious Revolution and Solitary Neglect, kind of the next thing we'll talk about. Uh, the Glorious Revolution, um, you had King James II who was on the throne in England at the time. He becomes pretty oppressive, starts taking away English rights, English charters over there in England. Um, he extends this to the New World. He takes the Puritans 
He strips them of their charter and he lumps them in with some other colonies and he calls it the Dominion of New England. If you understand Puritans, uh, this is something that angers them very greatly because they are now forced to let people worship uh, the Anglican Church, the Church of England, which they thought the Church of England was corrupt. That's what Puritan comes from, to purify the Anglican Church. Uh, so they're very, very, very upset and very resistant to this idea. Uh, James II becomes so unpopular in England that there is actually a coup against him. Uh, he is forced into exile and his daughter from his first wife, Mary, actually assumes the throne. She was a Protestant. James II made the mistake of openly practicing Catholicism um, in England. Not a good idea. England was pretty solidly Protestant by this point in time. Uh, so it makes a mistake there. Now, the British Revolution has some wonderful effects for the people of North America, these English settlers and what will once, they be, once become America. Um, they get so busy uh, well, plus, Governor Andrew, uh, Governor Andros was put over the Dominion of New England. He was hated, militaristic. The Puritans hated him. Of course, they would hate anybody put in that position. Um, they force him into exile uh, when the king is overthrown, and the colonies break back into different parts. Massachusetts is now, once again, Massachusetts. It's still never going to be quite as strict as it was before. Uh, the Puritans aren't going to have nearly the stranglehold that they have before, uh, but they're back. Um, and so England becomes very busy fixing their stuff, and this leads to a period of solitary neglect, meaning that uh, they allow the, the colonists to basically rule themselves, to take care of business in their, you know, doing it their own way. Uh, trade still flows between two countries, but they're not going to actively legislate uh, to the new colonies. Okay, we'll stop there.